First Sergeant Kep here with Company D, Second United States Sharpshooters. It has certainly been a while, and it's good to be back. I was down in the shop today sharpening some kitchen knives, and then I remembered one of our most, one of our most frequently asked questions. How did they sharpen things during the Civil War? Now, this is quite a rabbit hole of research that you, you can get into, and I'll just kind of refer you to a few places uh, to continue your research, I just kind of want to um, hit the high points to kind of get you started on that journey. So, sharpening. My primary source for you is going to, again, be the 1865 Quartermaster Manual. Because towards the back of the book, you will find a list of tools required for the various trades attached to the Army. Now, looking into the carpenter's tool list, of which we have a video, you will see that of all those tools, all those plain blades, all of those chisels, saws, axes, there is one oil stone. And that might kind of seem strange. Like today's modern sharpening has all sorts of jigs, you have diamond stones, and water stones, and surface plates, and abrasives, and you can spend hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of dollars on building your sharpening system. Those systems work. I mess around with quite a few of them, but that's not how they did it back then, and you really still don't even need to do it. Sharpening is actually fairly simple. So when you look through history, and you look at the amazing uh, buildings that were constructed, you look at the, the finest uh, antique furniture, they were all made, most likely, with one oil stone. Now, what kind of oil stones were available during the Civil War? Well, if you were in the United States, that would have been an Arkansas stone. You can still get Arkansas stones today. It is a uh, particular stone, and um, it comes in different grits. And you have like, some sort of science and geology that goes uh, behind that, but the essentially the, the color of the Arkansas stone will inform you as to the density of that stone. And so you still have uh, plenty of choices when it comes to your grits when using natural stones. Natural stones work very well, but if you're used to using modern abrasives uh, or diamond stones, for example, an Arkansas stone will cut a little bit slower, but in all my years of using them and going back and forth between modern and traditional, I don't really notice it. Um, maybe, maybe it might become a bear if you let your edges get really damaged, but really if, you're, if you have a damaged edge, you should be really using some really coarse grits a file of some sort or uh, a grinding wheel to kind of help you reset that edge and then you can clean it up with an Arkansas stone. So I get my Arkansas stones. I believe the the shop is what Dan's Arkansas stones. Fantastic website. Uh, lots of products and various prices to fit your budget. In my Civil War Carpenter's Toolbox that I sometimes take with me to events, I got the uh, medium and fine Arkansas stone already in the box. I paid a little bit more for this. I can't remember what I paid. $80 maybe? Something like that? Um, but anyone who sharpens often knows that you don't go cheap on your sharpening system. Um, try to get good materials made well and they will last you a lifetime. So I wasn't really worried about the price that much. I was paying a little bit more for the box because I was a little bit lazy that day. Now this stone, you can see there's a color difference between the two grits. And that is just the natural way that Arkansas stones work. I'm pretty sure they didn't have the uh, two stones glued together in some way during the Civil War. They probably would have just had one uh, or maybe a couple of these in a shop, but uh, you just need a, a, a nice stone. And I went with a medium and a fine because I'm not doing any massive tool restorations at an event. Uh, all my edges are taken uh, taken well care of. 
And so mostly I'm just uh, dressing up an edge, sharpening uh, somebody's pocket knife or, or a kitchen knife for somebody. So I don't need uh, the ability for heavy metal removal. Um, the only time I might do that is I keep a few files in my uh, toolbox. I don't take these with me on Bivouac, but I'll have a flat file and a triangle file for uh, saws or tight places. So that's what those will come in handy for. Now, when we talk about oil stones, another potential contentious topic is what do you lubricate your stone with? If you've used these before or you've always used these and you have a preferred lubricant, by all means, stick with it. Um, just uh, if you're going to be using it at an event, just make sure you put it in a nice period correct safe container um, and no one will know the difference. Um, but what I like to use is sort of an old timers trick and I use kerosene. So in my uh, toolbox, I have this larger one, uh, this little glass vial with a cork stopper of kerosene. In my knapsack, I have a, a really small vial of kerosene for lubricating my stone. I like kerosene, it works really well as a lubricant, which is I think why it's it's lasted for so long and been so well loved by craftspeople. But the other nice thing about kerosene is it's usually pretty easy to find at events if you say run out or you forget that uh, odds are someone's going to have kerosene in the camp, uh, especially at a mainstream event. So there's that other added bonus. But you can also use any, any oil that you're comfortable with that works well uh, for you. In my knapsack, I usually have a small Arkansas stone like this just, just to hone my edge on like my pocket knife or my hatchet if I'm doing really fine work with it. These are weigh almost nothing and they usually come in little leather uh, sleeves. I bought, th this one cost me $3 at an antique store years ago and it was never, it was brand new and it was $3 at an antique store. Now you can find uh, old antique Arkansas stones at antique stores and flea markets, sometimes yard sales. If they're dirty or hollowed out and the price is right, you can, you can buy it really affordably and then put in a little bit of time. You can clean old oil stones and you can even reflatten them. And there's videos out there that will walk you through that process and sort of the, the theory and practice of how to go about doing it. So you do have that um, low barrier entry point if you can get out and find these on a secondhand market. Um, but you can also just buy them brand new if, if you have the budget for it and there's a little less work to do. Now, for starting out, so maybe you don't know if you want to go this way or you, you want to practice or something like that. Or um, maybe it's not going to be a, a major part of your demonstration or you, you are on a fixed budget. You, you could consider using a non-period correct modern uh, oil stone. These ones, uh, these are like the $20, $25 Norton India stones that you can get on Amazon. And they'll, they'll work. They, the, unfortunately, the new ones look kind of modern. I mean, you have different colors on them. And, but they, they work great. So you can do all your sharpening with just one of these $20 stones. They work fine. And uh, I, I use them frequently. So you have a, a coarse side, the gray side, and then you have uh, probably a medium side. And uh, these are nice, these are these cut fast and they can get you back to work really quickly. And I made a box for them. So I, I wasn't feeling lazy that day. And so this is just a, uh, like a two by four, that I, I cut lengthwise and then I traced my stone onto. And then I took out the bulk of the waste with a Forstner bit and then cleaned up the edges with a chisel and cleaned up the bottom with a router plane. And then I have a nice 
box to keep my oil stone safe. Because remember, this was this was common practice is be to use your oil stone in a box. Now, you may have noticed on both of these boxes, I have a piece of veg tan glued to the top. Well, one, these Dan's ones have their really nice logo uh, etched into the lid. So I needed to cover that up, but you also need to have a strop. So part two of traditional sharpening is you have a natural stone or like an Arkansas stone, typically in a box, and then you have a strop. I pre-charge my strops with uh, flex cut. It's very modern, it's not period correct at all, but you can't tell that it's in the leather. Uh, but you don't need any rubbing combat compound or brace of compound uh, in your leather for it to strop. So as long as you have a piece of leather, you get your, your sharp edge, right? So the reason why these worked and worked for so long was essentially the, the basics of sharpening is that you sharpen until you turn a burr on your edge. If you don't have a burr, it's never going to be sharp. So you sharpen until you get a burr. Do the other side of that edge if it's double-sided. Get that side to burr, flip it over, knock the burr off, and then you're ready to strop. Now, it's people will, will know that when you sharpen something, that technique in practice is really important. But what will, what will happen for a lot of beginners is they'll overlook that you have to use that same technique to strop with. Because it's really easy to round an edge while stropping. Stropping doesn't really remove any material. I mean, it does like on the microscopic level, but you, you can still turn your edge if you're being sloppy with your technique. So if you're paying attention to your sharpening, pay attention to your stropping and you'll get a nice sharp edge every single time. And lastly, what size stone do I need? Well, how big of a tool are you going to be sharpening? I went with this one because in my carpenter's toolbox, I have some hand planes. So I needed to have a stone large enough to sharpen my plain irons. And um, it also, since it's a little bit bigger, it'll sharpen a pocket knife a little bit faster. That is in my big toolbox, which I don't take to every event. For uh, bivouacs and campaign impressions, I just take this little stone because I'm just doing little stuff or touching up an edge on something and I have this in a little leather sleeve and I have a little jar of kerosene to, to lubricate it with. And that's how that works. So base your stone size base to the tools that you will be needing to use um, the sharpening stone on. Now. I do want to address one thing. So you see here, I have my World War I era Keystone Railroad Grinder that I restored. <clears throat> I use this for heavy material uh, removal. I have a modern, I think 120 grit Norton stone on it. And I love this thing, it works fantastic. And you may be thinking like, well, you know, you have to crank and use one hand. It's like with everything, it's just, it's muscle memory and practice. This is the way that they would, they had water stones for this same purpose throughout throughout history. So it was much more common to know how to do it uh, than it is for people today. And this is a nice little reminder to kind of keep up those traditional skills. I can't tell you any of the history about these sort of hand crank grinders. My best guess is that these are all post-war because the way that we see these are with the modern style Norton stones. And I think I think we didn't see, see those until 1867 at the earliest, I believe. So the, the stones would have been modern and these, so I, I can't tell you how far back uh, hand grinders like this go. But if you look in the blacksmithing tools portion of the quartermaster manual, you will find, um, a uh, water stone and those would have been because the blacksmith toolkit would have been like part of a wagon it was it was a whole setup and so blacksmiths also have to remove a lot more material from metal than a carpenter would 
So you would have like a, one of those sandstone wheels and they would sit in a pool of water or you'd, they'd be dripped on with water and they'd have some sort of um, foot pedal or hand crank to, to crank the sandstone and you would grind on. Uh, it's pretty impractical, um, but those would have been what would have been like the equivalent of, of these more modern uh, hand crank grinders. And you can still find them. Uh, I think places still even sell uh, replacement sandstone wheels if you have the budget for it. Uh, I've seen smaller tabletop sandstone water wheel uh, setups, but I couldn't tell you their origin or their history or their authenticity. But if you are interested or maybe you, will, you do a blacksmith impression, that could be something for you to look into as well as part of your Civil War sharpening system. All of this is to say that a sharp edge is a safe edge. And this all comes down to tool maintenance and respect for our tools. Uh, it's so common to see, especially like axes, just brutalized being used by different units at events. Um, these tools would have been very important to soldiers and very well maintained for the most part. Granted, you will have some abuses, but there is an understanding that this is a tool. We rely on this tool. This will build our, um, our shebang dominiums. This will build a fire. This will build our winter quarters. We need to take care of these edge tools because these tools were not uh, as disposable as modern tools are. For more information and like a real deep dive into sort of historical sharpening, Mr. Chickadee did a fantastic video on that. He can uh, explain that portion of it. And then if you've ever been a fan of the Woodwright Shop uh, with Roy Underhill, PBS still has many episodes on his uh, on online. And if you watch all those Woodwright Shop videos, for those of you not familiar with Roy, he's a traditional woodworker and all those amazing things that he he makes from way back when to today he uses one stone an arkansas stone or an oil stone of some sort and a strop and it works uh, so if you're interested in dabbling in historic sharpening methods i highly recommend it i think you'll find it very rewarding and it's a really nice subtle but rewarding way to improve your Civil War impression. Let us know if you have any questions down below. Thanks as always for liking and subscribing. Stay well, and we'll see you next time.